I'm Caleb with the Nestucca, Neskowin, and Sand Lake Watershed Council. Uh, I am the Outreach and Project Development Manager. I wanted to give a quick uh, introduction on the goals of our educational film here today. Uh, we were asked, we being the Watershed Council, uh, were asked by the Nesquin Community Association to make a, a short film on what is a watershed, what does a watershed council do, um, and most specifically how you guys can get involved. Um, our, our goals as a watershed council is, is really to engage the community and get people to change the way that they interact with their watershed. So hopefully you guys can learn something today and uh, there'll be lots of opportunities to get involved if you're interested. So thanks for watching. The National Oceanic and Atmospheric Association describes a watershed as a land area that channels rainfall and snowmelt to creeks, streams, and rivers, and eventually to outflow points such as reservoirs, bays, and the ocean. Similarly, the United States Geological Survey describes a watershed as an area of land that drains all the streams and rainfall to a common outlet, such as the outflow of a reservoir, mouth of a bay, or any point along a stream channel. Another really great tool for visualizing a watershed is a website called wikiwatersheds.com. I'll show you how to use it now. To access the Wiki Watershed Toolkit, you're first going to want to open a web browser and then navigate to the wikiwatershed.org website. It should be your first option. Now that we're on the Wiki Watershed website, we will be given the option to explore many different features. We will choose the Model My Watershed on the top left. We can launch the app. It now displays an Esri style map that you're probably familiar with. Since we are discussing the Nesquin watershed, we can begin to zoom in on that area. Once you have zoomed into an appropriate level, you can click the Get Started button on the left. Here you're given some more options. We will choose the third one down, Delineate Watershed, with a continental U.S. medium resolution. At this point, Wiki Watershed is ready to delineate any watershed in which you click on the outlet point. Since I clicked on the outlet of Nesquin Creek, it delineated the entire Nesquin watershed. Within this tool, you're given a lot of information, such as the number of stream miles, the land type use, soil infiltration rates, terrain, and so forth. Alternatively, if you wanted to delineate a subbasin within the Nesquin watershed, you could simply click back and do that same process again. This time we'll click on a tributary within the Nesquin River. This would be the Prospect Creek Subbasin of the Nesquin Watershed. So now that we have a good working knowledge of what a watershed is, Let's take a more in-depth look at some of the natural processes and e ecosystem functions that occur in a healthy watershed. For this next section, um, part two of what is a watershed, uh, I'm gonna give a broad biological and ecological context to some different watershed functions and ecosystem benefits and services. Uh, this introduction will hopefully set the stage for Garshaw talking uh, more about specific projects that the Watershed Council does. To, to simplify this topic down to something suitable for this presentation, uh, I had to admit a lot of detail. It's a really, really big topic with, uh, with a lot of different moving parts. 
um, something that I found was really, really helpful to sort of simplify it was some environmental protection agency uh, watershed training modules that I found online. Um, they were really concise with some great information, so I, uh, I used them a lot and uh, I'll cite them and reference them accordingly um, and I'll add, I'll add some website links towards the end of the, uh, towards the end of the presentation here. Um, in addition to that EPA website, which I'll share with you, there's some really, really good books about watershed health, um, particularly salmon, because that's the area we're in. And I want to share a couple with you now. That's sort of the direction I would go, uh, or I hope you guys go, is to pick up some reading on your own and start to educate yourself on these issues of watershed health and in salmonid populations. But here's a few that I would recommend. Um, they're, they're fairly easy reading, but also contain some great information. So good for a beginner to an expert alike. Uh, the first one is by David Montgomery. It's called The King of Fish, The Thousand Year Run of Salmon. Um, David Montgomery was a geomorphologist at the University of Washington. Um, so this book is really focused on habitat and things like sediment transport and floodplain connectivity and disconnectivity. So that's a really, really uh, relevant book to hear this Tillamook area in our different agricultural settings. So that's a great one I'd recommend. Uh, another one by a University of Washington professor is Salmon People in Place by Jim Lichtowich. He is a fisheries biologist, so this one uh, talks more about fish than it does about habitat, but it also talks a lot about habitat. Um, and where this one's a little different is he really delves into some of the cultural and spiritual benefits that a healthy watershed and healthy salmon, salmon runs provide. So another book that's great from a little bit different perspective Another one by the same author is Salmon Without Rivers. Um, this was the first book that Jim Lichtowich wrote. Uh, and this book looks into the idea of growing salmon without healthy watersheds and healthy rivers uh, via hatcheries and sort of the fallacies that were involved in that myth and uh, how the hatchery program didn't work out quite as well as we'd want without a healthy watershed. A healthy watershed is, is key to having healthy salmon runs. Another salmon specific book that is, it's got a lot of information, it's kind of difficult reading, but I'll still recommend it, is Salmon 2100. Um, a number of different experts in their respective fields were asked, uh, what do you think salmon will look like in the year 2100 at our current trajectory? Um, I'll kind of admit that the authors don't give a great diagnosis for salmon unless we sort of change the ways that we interact with rivers in our watersheds. Uh, but again, I'd recommend that because it, it is a wealth of knowledge. And the last one I'm going to recommend is less about watersheds and salmon, but one that I use all the time when I'm out hiking, and that's Plants of the Pacific Northwest Coast by Pojar and McKinnon. Um, this is probably the book I carry around the most. It's always in my truck, always in my backpack when I'm out hiking. Uh, and this has all the plants in our area here in the Nesquin, Nestucca watershed, um, and up to British Columbia. So this is a really great book. It's got great pictures, tons of great information. So definitely pick that one up as well. In these last two things I'm going to recommend are more uh, technical documents. Um, the first one is the river continuum concept. Uh, I'm not sure where you can get this for free online. Uh, it is an academic journal, so it would be in any uh, academic journal database, but you can probably also find this online. Um, I'll put a link to it at the end of the, uh, at the talk here. And the last one is a stream evolution, <clears throat> a stream evolution model integrating habitat and ecosystem benefits. Um, so this paper was put out in 2004, and since then, um, actually when I printed this, in 2016, so only two years later, it had already been cited 4,888 times. So this is really a seminal, game-changing paper about how river systems evolve within a watershed. Um, I wish I could go into more detail on all of these papers, but I really, really encourage you to pick this one up. Um, if you can't find it online, get in touch with me 
and uh, I'll see what I can do if I can dig it up and, uh, and send it on over to you. So this is really, really a great paper on how channel morphology evolves within a watershed. So with that said, let's take a, a little bit more of a look at some of the natural functions and ecosystem processes uh, or ecosystem services and benefits. Again, a real broad look, but it, it should give you some information to get you started. So, all right, let's take a look. So for this next section, which is uh, part two of what is a watershed, we're gonna discuss some watershed functions. Uh, I, we simplified it down, or I simplified it down into three main topics, uh, transport and storage, cycling and transformation, and ecological succession. Um, I got a lot of this information from an EPA training watershed training module. Um, the link is there at the bottom. If you're interested, there's a lot more information on that website. Uh, it's really accessible, and so I'd recommend checking that out if you're interested. So when we talk about transport and storage, uh, we're primarily talking about uh, three things, the transport and storage of water. Uh, a watershed is essentially an enormous precipitation collecting and routing device where water falls in the headwaters, um, moves through the forested areas into the riparian and down into the river uh, through various pathways. Um, there's also the transport and storage of sediments as that water is moving, it collects sediments and also moves that sediment, um, sometimes in very, very large earth flows like landslides, but more commonly um, just in smaller sediment transport through our regular, regular flooding. Uh, in addition to that, the sediment and the water, you also get pollutants picked up. Um, tend, they tend to bind to sediment um, and move through the watershed in that manner. Our primary uh, pollutants are E. coli and uh, sediment is actually considered a pollutant when it reaches a certain level. Um, and frequently during our really big winter storms, the sediment uh, exceeds that pollution threshold. So it, it reaches a level where sediment is considered to be a pollutant as well. <clears throat> so cycling and transformation also has you know, three main points to it. One being carbon cycling, which is what we call food webs, um, starting with photosynthetic animals, moving all the way up to apex predators, and how that carbon cycles through at different rates, um, and the way it changes, uh, not forms, but you know, the way it cycles through uh, different forms. Uh, the next one I would point out is biogeochemical and nitrogen cycling. Um, biogeochemicals being phosphorus, potassium, um, and other elements that move through the watershed. Uh, nitrogen is a cycle that's very well documented and detailed because nitrogen is frequently a limiting factor. Um, that would be another example of a, you know, of, of, a, of a cycle. Um, the last one is decomposition, and that's the breaking down of energy-rich organic molecules into uh, forms that are once again usable. So this is a little bit different than carbon cycling, um, but I guess somewhat similar to that. Uh, maybe the difference would be that decomposition is usually done by microorganisms and it's breaking it down into more of its constituent, constituent elements. The last watershed function, or at least the last one that we'll talk about in the simplified version, is that a watershed is really dynamic. It's always in flux. It's always changing. There's really no steady state watershed. Um, any of our attempts to keep a watershed from changing, it's usually a kind of an expensive proposition. So we're learning to live with the watershed. Um, maybe taking a more ecological approach. Um, and another thing is that within a watershed, there's a variety of spatial scales. So within say Nesquin watershed, there could be an old growth forest, there could be a timber plot, there could be some meadows, there could be houses. There's gonna be a lot of variety within that, um, within that one watershed. So we call that a variety of spatial scales. Uh, again, check out that EPA website. Uh, that'll give you a ton more information. 
So the last thing I'm going to talk about is some ecosystem benefits and services. I think these are kind of self-explanatory, but definitely want to point them out because it's really important to, uh, to know that there is a lot of value in a healthy watershed. Uh, before I talk about any of these, I want to say that it's, it's really impossible to calculate what a healthy watershed is really worth in any accounting effort is typically, in my opinion, it's erred on the side of not valuing the watershed uh, highly enough. There's certain intrinsic parts of a watershed that are just really hard to measure, but some things we, we can measure are improved water quality, um, saves money for the water treatment facilities if the water coming in is, is of high quality, um, carbon storage opportunities, uh, what's becoming known as blue carbon or ecosystem carbon, where carbon is being stored in something like an estuary like Sand Lake, uh, increased resiliency in the face of climate change, um, some reduced risk for invasive species colonization. In certain areas, uh, invasive species are a very, very, very expensive thing to combat. So the healthier the watershed is and the more native plants, um, you're going to reduce the risk for invasive species colonization, uh, reduce flood mitigation costs, and increase tourism revenue. Um, that's becoming increasingly well known that uh, people want to get out and, and recreate in a beautiful watershed. So that's just, that's just a few, certainly not an exhaustive list, um, but that's uh, that's a start on some of the ecosystem benefits and services. Um, I mean, you could also definitely add things like fisheries to our area, um, fishing and hunting, things like that. Um, I guess that could all go under increased tourism revenue. But, but yeah, the takeaway message is that a healthy watershed uh, really is a valuable thing, especially, uh, especially here where we live. So I think uh, that's going to be the end of my talk or my section and now Garsha is going to talk a bit about what the watershed council does more specifically um so yeah let's move on my name is Garsha Media Abraham and I'm the director and coordinator of the watersheds council we have two people on staff um including myself and Caleb Menser, who's our Outreach and Project Development Manager. And we also have nine board members. Our board members are the core of our Watershed Council. They drive all of our decisions and uh, they're really the heart of our organization. Um, our board is comprised of a diverse group of folks um, and they include farmers, uh, fishermen, folks who work in the forest resources uh, industry, um, federal and local natural resource management agencies and general subject matter experts and everyday citizens as well. Um, so we have representation for every watershed in, within our council. And these watersheds include um, the Nestucca River watershed, the Little Nestucca River watershed, the Sand Lake watershed, and the Nesquin watershed. In summary, our watershed council works to improve the health of our watersheds through implementing restoration projects, streamside plantings, invasive species control, education, outreach, and community events related to the South Tillamook County watershed. For this portion of the video, we're gonna talk about the Nesquin watershed, what the Nestucca, Nesquin, and Sand Lake Watersheds Council is, what we do, and how Nesquin citizens can get involved. The mission of our watershed council Working in partnership with private and governmental stakeholders is to improve the environmental health of our watersheds to benefit those who live and work within our boundaries and for the fish and wildlife that depend on it. Okay, uh, now I'm going to talk about uh, major landowners in the Nesquilin watershed. Um, so I have Nesquin watershed highlighted here. Um, and we're using the Oregon Explorer tool, mapping tool. This is OregonExplorer.info. And you go to tools and you go to Oregon Explorer map viewer. It's a very useful tool. You can put on uh, many different layers. Um, 
And so for now we have our watershed highlighted um, with our creeks highlighted. This is the Nesquin watershed. Um, and we're gonna look at land ownership now. Okay, here we have the land ownership uh, layer turned on. Um, you can see in the upper watershed, um, I'm gonna talk about it in terms of upper watersheds and lower watersheds, and I apologize, it's hard to see where the watershed is delineated. Um, but in the upper watershed, we have sort of a checkerboard of um, US Forest Service and um, private industrial uh, timber. So the private or the public land is represented uh, by the green and the um, private industrial land is uh, represented by this tan color. And this, this ownership layer is from 2015, so it might not be completely updated. Um, so getting more into the lower watersheds, we have more privately owned land, and this includes uh, wood lots, small wood lots as well, as well as rural residential. Um, and so that's represented by the yellow. And as we get down into the very lower watershed, we have um, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service National Wildlife Refuge. Um, and then uh, we have the Nesquin Beach Golf Course, which is down here. And then we have um, the um, Oregon State Parks Wayside, which is down here. We also have a very small uh, amount of land owned by the North Coast Land Conservancy um, that was donated by um, a private landowner up on Butte Creek. And that's not on this map, but um, that's also part of the land ownership. So the Nesquiman watershed is uh, rich in natural resources. Um, our fish and wildlife are managed by the Oregon Department of Fish and Wildlife and the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. Um, our timber is managed by the U.S. Forest Service and private landowners. And this includes both uh, private industrial timber companies and uh, small woodlot owners. Our drinking water is managed by the Nesquiman Water District up on uh, Upper Hawk Creek and uh, Everybody really manages the watershed in a way. Every action we have plays a part in the watershed health. So this is a aerial photo of the Nesquiman Beach Golf Course. And you can also see the National Wildlife Refuge in the background. Um, you can see Butte Creek running through the golf course and Kiwanda Creek as well. And there's some residencies down here and forest up here. And it just shows that Within the watershed, we have many different types of landowners and we all play a part in uh, the overall watershed health. So roads are incredibly important to uh, people, businesses, and the livelihood of folks living in South Tillamook County. Our roads down here are managed by Tillamook County Public Works. Uh, the Oregon Department of Transportation, private industrial timber companies, which um, manage their own roads, uh, and private road owner associations and private landowners. Uh, all roads have some sort of impact to our watersheds, especially if they're poorly built. Uh, roads can act as a direct pathway for surface runoff. Uh, this can decrease groundwater infiltration and soil storage and eventually uh, decrease summertime flows. Uh, the surface water runoff can also be highly erosive, causing sedimentation and greater erosion and incision in the stream, uh, which can cause uh, down cutting and the eventual lowering of the groundwater or of the water table. And essentially they can alter natural drainage characteristics. Um, additionally, when roads and streams are hydrologically connected, chemical runoff generated from the road prism can enter the stream. Um, the straightening and channelizing of streams to accommodate roads decreases habitat complexity. It confines the stream and cuts the stream off from its floodplain, which also decreases groundwater infiltration. So the chemical runoff and sedimentation I previously mentioned can have implications for uh, drinking water as well. Um, if this is occurring upstream of a drinking water intake, it can cause um, or it can necessitate additional 
purification and filtration, uh, which can make the overall process more expensive and less feasible. Um, and so this is sort of uh, a part of the link between watershed health and um, drinking water and human health. So this is a photo of the crossing of Hawk Street and a wetland tributary at the OPRD wayside. Um, you can see road failure here, uh, two undersized culverts um, that are completely blocked. Uh, you can see surface water running completely over the road and scouring out portions of the road. And so this would uh, be considered a large fish passage barrier, which we'll talk about in a second but it's also a public safety hazard. This crossing will be addressed as a part of the larger Nescoan emergency egress project. So undersized uh, road and stream cause crossings can cause fish passage issues for several reasons. Um, failing culverts physically block fish passage by um, having one end perched, um, or the culvert can also be dilapidated and cause a, a physical fish passage barrier. Um, undersized culverts also concentrate stream flow, which, when, which can cause a fire hose effect. Um, and this creates a velocity barrier for fish. They have a hard time moving through that fast flowing water. Um, and additionally, undersized culverts block natural stream processes such as gravel and large woody debris transport, um, which are very important for fish habitat and stream and river processes. Um, and additionally, these small culverts put the road at risk of failure um, through uh, blowout and flooding, which you could see in the previous slide. Um, so these are just photos of various uh, culverts that we have addressed or will address over the years. Um, this top left, and um, top middle, this is West Beaver Creek in the Nestucca watershed. And you can see um, that these culverts were very dilapidated um, and very close to failure. Um, the, these bottom culverts, uh, this is along South Beach Road um, in Nescowin, and this is uh, Sutton Creek. And these culverts down here have not yet been replaced, but are slated for replacement. Um, and these culverts are um, sort of buried in sediment, also uh, dilapidated um, and approaching failure. Um, and the road is at risk in this area as well. Our Watershed Council implements stream and river restoration projects to reestablish natural stream and river processes. These projects benefit fish and wildlife habitat, improve water quality, and improve infrastructure so it is resilient to climate change and natural disaster. We also implement habitat enhancement projects that directly benefit sensitive salmonid species. As mentioned earlier, much of our work is focused around fish passage, which is identified as a limiting factor for salmonid production in our basins. This means we replace old failing undersized culverts at road stream crossings with large culverts or better yet bridges. The stream bed at the new crossing structure is designed to create easy upstream passage for fish and also allows the river to transport wood and gravel that is essential to downstream habitat and general watershed health. Since the new crossing allows for full fish passage the habitat upstream of the new crossing becomes available for fish use. Much of this habitat is critical for spawning and salmonid production. The new crossings are also designed to pass flood water. Thus, the flood risk to the road is greatly reduced. Here you can see the result of a project our Watershed Council implemented in 2012 at the crossing of Butte Creek and a county road. This new structure passes fish easily. It can pass gravel and wood and creates a more resilient road. Here's a photo of the project pre-construction. You can see that the culvert is undersized and blocks fish passage. Post-construction, 
the landowner donated a portion of her land to the North Coast Land Conservancy for environmental stewardship and preservation. So let's talk about Butte Creek a little more since it's a highly productive stream uh, in Neskowin and it's really important for the overall watershed. Um, as an example of some of the work that we do, uh, our watershed council is working to address all the remaining fish barriers on Butte Creek. Um, <clears throat> these barriers, uh, there's three remaining barriers. The downstream most barrier is uh, two undersized culverts with top hinged tide gates. This is at the crossing of Hawk Street in Butte Creek near the Neskowin Beach Golf Course. These tide gates are always in the open position. However, the culverts themselves are undersized um, and during high tides and during high foot water flow events, they get overtopped. Um, they create velocity barriers for salmon traveling upstream. Uh, this project is fully designed. Um, our Watershed Council has worked with partners to uh, fully fund the project as well. Um, it's led by Tillamook County Public Works and it will be implemented in uh, the summer of 2021 as a part of the larger Neskowin Emergency Egress Road Project, which also addresses barriers at the crossing of Hawk Street and Hawk Creek and uh, Hawk Street and a wetland tributary, which we saw earlier when we were discussing roads. The next upstream crossing is an ODOT culvert uh, on Highway 101, the intersection of 101 and Butte Creek. This culvert is also undersized um, and was uh, rated by ODOT as uh, in a critical condition and approaching failure. The bolts are rusted, water is traveling through very quickly and it's uh, causing a velocity barrier for fish. And ODOT is working to, um, or they have prioritized the project internally and um, are looking, is look, they're looking for funding for uh, a 2021 to 2024 replacement. Um, and the last remaining barrier, the most upstream remaining barrier is on Sunbow Drive, the intersection of Butte Creek and Sunbow Drive. Uh, this is one pipe that is undersized and the bottom is rusted out and broken and uh, approaching failure. Um, again, it's a velocity barrier because the pipe is undersized, it creates a fire hose effect. And so this was during a rain event um, in January of 2020. And you can see that water is traveling through very quickly. It's traveling out of the outlet and you can see the drop over here. And so this makes it very difficult for fish to travel upstream. Currently our Watershed Council is seeking funding uh, to for the design for this project. And so hopefully if everything goes smoothly, we'll be able to replace this crossing in the summer of 2022. Streamside plantings, also known as riparian plantings, are an excellent and relatively easy way for a watershed council to engage landowners and make a large difference in improving habitat and watershed health. Our council has completed dozens of these riparian planting projects and currently has several ongoing. Streamside planting is important for several reasons. Uh, riparian plants prevent stream and river erosion. They provide shading, which cools the water temperatures for salmonid habitat. They improve water quality. They improve habitat quality through eventual large woody debris recruitment. Um, and they increase floodplain interaction, which is important for the water table and off-channel fish habitat. Uh, this is a side-by-side uh, -side of uh, pre-planting and post-planting project um, in the Neskowin watershed. This is up, up Slab Creek. Um, and this occurred in the 2018-2019 planting season. Just to give you an idea of the scale, um, in 2020, we planted 11.1 .1 acres and worked with 15 different landowners um, throughout all of our watersheds. Uh, the trees we plant are generally spruce, cedar, hemlock, maple, cottonwood, and alder. And the shrubs include twinberry, ninebark, dogwood, spirea, Current, cascara, thimbleberry, and elderberry. And of course, that we include uh, willows as well. And oftentimes, landowners will prefer different plants as well. And of course, we work with landowners to 
plant the plants that they prefer. Another example of projects we do are habitat enhancement projects. Uh, these projects directly improve salmonid habitat and mostly include large woody debris placements. Um, so large woody debris in streams increases gravel recruitment, which is really important for spawning fish. Um, they provide shelter uh, from predators. They provide shading and complex habitat for fish as well. They also can increase floodplain interaction, which is great for off-channel fish habitat. Um, so these photos are from a large woody debris placement project that our Watershed Council conducted about 10 years ago, a little more than 10 years ago now, in the upper Nestucca, or upper Little Nestucca watershed at the confluence with Stillwell Creek. Um, so these logs were placed by helicopter. <clears throat> and you can see these, this is a pre-project. This is just after project implementation. So you can see that the logs are placed here. And this photo upper in the upper right is actually um, was taken in August 2019, about 10 years after the project, in the exact same spot. And so you can see that um, while it, it is in the summer and uh, more vegetation would be growing during that season, there is generally more vegetation in this area because of the increased gravel recruitment. Um, you can also see that there's a lot of channel complexity and um, a lot of gravel in this area now. Um, and so it increases the overall habitat complexity of this area to benefit uh, salmonid species. So another type of project we do are uh, estuary restoration projects. Um, recent research has shown that estuaries are incredibly important for the life history of salmonids, um, especially in the rearing phase. Um, <clears throat> in Oregon Coast estuaries and in our estuaries as well, Years of diking, ditching, and tide gate installation for farming and development has blocked off critical salmonid rearing habitat. Um, so these projects often include uh, the removal or a breach of dikes to restore historic off-channel salmonid habitat. Uh, they also improve estuary water quality and restore vegetation communities that are uh, native to our region. Um, Another type of estuary project we're doing are uh, tide gate inventories. Um, so we're trying to understand the type, size, and location of these tide gates, which could potentially be um, estuary fish passage barriers. Um, <clears throat> additionally, the replacement, updating, or removal of failing tide gates uh, can improve fish passage and water quality. And uh, finally, the restoration of historical estuary channels to create more estuary rearing habitat. Uh, so these are photos of different estuaries in our basins. Um, upper left is the Nestucca estuary. Um, this is the Nestucca Wildlife Refuge, um, right at the mouth of the Little Nestucca. And there are two, um, tide gates, two failing tide gates, um, and uh, some cross levees and interior ditches. So this project is replacing the two tide gates, um, cleaning the ditches, cleaning silt out of the ditches to uh, improve water quality and some haunted habitat, um, to re-meander and restore some historical tidal channels um, in the interior of the ditches, and to also plant out some of these interior areas um, in the hopes that it'll restore water quality and the replacement of the tide gates will restore fish passage. Um, the lower left, <clears throat> we see the Sandy Lake Estuary um, south of Belts Dyke. So um, below this photo is Belts Dyke and this is the est part of the estuary that's blocked off by the dike and a small undersized tide gate. This project involves breaching uh, Belts Dyke to uh, restore the natural estuary regime. Um, also part of this project are to address three um, undersized culverts on Sand Lake Road that um, empty into the estuary. Um, so it's both a tidal restoration and fish passage project. And finally, uh, the view on the right, uh, the picture on the right, we see uh, the Nesquin Marsh, um, which is 
actually also an estuary zone. It's tidally influenced. And um, so the goal of this, this is part of the Nest, uh, Nesco and Emergency Egress Road project. And the goal of this project is to restore fish passage and tidal exchange across the egress road, which um, runs along right here. Those are just some examples of projects that we're engaged in in uh, different estuaries in our basin. Another type of project our council is beginning to get involved in is uh, water quality monitoring. Uh, previously, our, water, our watershed council had been involved in bacteria and temperature monitoring through TEP's, uh, uh, that's Tillamook Estuary Partnerships Volunteer Water Quality Monitoring Program. Uh, we are currently developing our own water quality monitoring for temperature and bacteria. Um, we were funded uh, through the Oregon Watershed Enhancement Board to start up a program. Um, and particularly, particularly in Nestlein, there will be a special focus on bacteria monitoring. Um, but we're going to be doing both temperature and bacteria throughout our basins. Um, so monitoring is really important to um, understand patterns and, patterns and trends in our watersheds um, to establish baseline conditions for our watersheds. Uh, so we have reference conditions for future monitoring and um, also assessing uh, water quality conditions post-project as well. Um, it's good to have something to compare that to. Um, also um, identifying streams and rivers that are temperature limited um, and have a negative impact on fish habitat um, that, that can be improved and there's room for improvement. Uh, identifies streams and rivers that have uh, bacteria and uh, can pose a health hazard um, for humans um, to identify uh, non-point sources of pollution, um, especially from uh, agriculture, and uh, just for future monitoring efforts as well. So um, these are uh, sites that will be bacteria monitoring, um, TEP, uh, does some of these sites already, and we're just going to be adding on to that. Um, and so this is all bacteria monitoring um, in Nesquin, focused around Nesquin Village. And we're hoping to have this program start up at the beginning of uh, 2021. Um, we've already established a sampling and analysis plan, and we're just uh, working on getting volunteers and also uh, getting all the equipment. So our Watershed Council has lots of fun and engaging events throughout the year. Um, and I'll just go through some photos and show you, uh, show you what they're like. Um, so this is a photo from the Nestucca Bay cleanup um, in the spring of 2019. We have this event um, every other year um, on odd years. Um, and so we'll have one in 2021, hopefully. Um, Nesquin Valley School uh, plant propagation class. Um, and so this is a watershed education event where uh, we team up with uh, TEP and uh, hold a plant propagation class uh, for kids so they can learn about how, how plants grow and native riparian vegetation. <clears throat> These are um, photos from various uh, events. We have um, an event series in partnership with TEP called Explore Nature. And this includes many different uh, events, but a lot of them are sort of outdoor related. Um, and so the upper left is um, a nature hike in the Nestucca National Wildlife Refuge. Um, and this one was sort of centered around uh, uh, silver spot butterfly habitat. Um, this one in the upper right is the Whalen Island Scotch Broom Bust. Um, and we also paired that with a nature hike on Whalen Island. We had folks from OPRD uh, giving us a tour, leading the nature walk. Um, the bottom left is the Little Nestucca um, paddle. And this was also an Explore Nature event. Uh, it was a kayaking event in the Little Nestucca River 
estuary area. Um, and that was a lot of fun. That was in the summer of 2019. And uh, our events this year have been limited due to COVID, but we were able to get out on a seed collection through uh, the Northwest Oregon uh, Restoration Partnership um, and uh, collect some seeds uh, for them to propagate uh, native riparian vegetation. Um, additionally, we have our science pubs, which are fairly popular events. Um, the Pelican Brewing, uh, Pelican Brewery uh, lets us host these events in their event room. Um, we usually try to have three to five of these per year during the winter months. Um, and so we had a great series last year and we're hoping to get these started up as soon as we can, but obviously conditions have not allowed us to do this. Um, so before we conclude our video, I also wanted to give a shout out to our partners who um, are incredibly important to our Watershed Council. We, everything we do is collaborative. Uh, we wouldn't be able to get the amount of work that we do get done, uh, completed without their help, um, whether it's through a cash uh, con contribution or through uh, technical assistance. Um, so we work with the United States Forest Service, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, uh, the Natural Resource Conservation Service, Tilma County Soil and Water Conservation District, uh, Tilma County Public Works, the Oregon Department of Fish and Wildlife, um, and some of our major funders are the Oregon Watershed Enhancement Board. Um, we pretty regularly get funding from the Sayusla Collaborative Watershed Restoration Program, also known as the Ebo Stewardship Group. And we work very closely with Trout Unlimited and uh, the Super Salmon Superhighway uh, Collaborative, which is a uh, sort of a group of partners that um, we are implementing these fish passage projects with. Um, so, yeah, those are our partners and they're really important to us. Well, so that's the end of our educational film. Uh, we hope you guys learned something. Uh, and maybe are a little more excited about watershed restoration. If you're interested in uh, getting involved in a project or volunteering with the council, you can reach out by phone, email, or visit our website, uh, and we'll, we can get you directed in the right way. So thanks again for watching, and we look forward to seeing you this next year. All right. Uh... Hello, so we're sitting here with uh, Guy Holdsworth. He's our longest standing board member. Um, how long have you been with the Watershed Council for? I, I think 19 years. 19 years? Okay. 18 or 19 years. Okay, which, in what year were we founded again? Do you remember? I don't know, I wasn't part of the original group. Okay. But I think it was five or six years before. running before. I lived in Otis, so I couldn't be on it at first okay. until I moved back over here. Great. So how did you get involved? Uh, what, what, what made you get involved? And, um, well, I was recruited by the uh, coordinator at the time, a friend of mine. And it also falls into the think globally, act locally kind of philosophy. Try to get something done in your own neighborhood. So. Gotcha. Great. That's uh, why I joined up. And before that, you were with the Water District, correct? I worked for 34 years running the Nescalin Regional Water District. Cool. Great. Um, so that's kind of a unique perspective, you know, having that Water District drinking water perspective and then um, sort of overshed water, overall watershed health perspective, looking at, you know, fish and wildlife, big picture sort of things. Um, so, uh, with your time with the Watershed Council, how have you seen the council itself grow um, in terms of mission and scope, but also in terms of its board composition? Yeah, quite a bit. Uh, when I joined, we really weren't doing much. Tom McDermott was planting trees for us. And I became president my third meeting, so I still didn't know what we were doing then. <laughs> and it took a while. It, it does take a while to understand exactly how we function. Yeah. But I would say the board has just 
expanded so much and the board we have right now is, is excellent with people from all works of life different viewpoints and and we're still we can get together and get these amazing projects done which you actually do we just kind of hired you I guess <laughs> <laughs> well, it couldn't be done without you guys as well, your support and direction and everything. Well, yeah, the board's really grown, I think, and the council itself, the, because everybody here lives around here, uh, it's got more on board and we get, I mean, we had not ever done, never ripped a call without build a bridge before, the, before Alex, really, mm -hmm. as far as I know. And now it's commonly every day. What we do, four this year? Uh, four last year, yeah. Four, two, four two bridges year. in a year. <laughs> it's yeah. Pretty amazing. It's a lot. Um, yeah, I mean, this, like I said earlier, this wouldn't be able to happen without board support and board direction and everything. So you guys are really the heart of the Watershed Council. Um, so over the years, have you seen sort of an evolution or a change in? Um, watershed issues, uh, especially um, focusing in on Neskalin, has there been sort of a shift in focus at all? Or, um, you know, just as, you know, just as we go through the times, I know this past decade, past couple decades, there has been a lot of development and a lot of new research and, you know, we're learning a lot more about our watersheds. So, uh, just wondering if you have any thoughts on that. I don't know if it's a shift in focus, but an expansion of focus. In that, like I said, we never, as far as I know, never had ripped culverts out to open up streams for fish passage, which we ret routinely do now. We were planting trees, we're planting more trees now than ever, I believe. And just all together, new things come up. Uh, Highgate survey was a new thing, mm -hmm. and that's still new for us as to where we go with that. But sure, I think it's just been a general the the community at large is more interested in what we do, and because we've gotten a lot done. I think. Absolutely. Um, in terms of uh, you know, like you're saying, uh, thinking locally. Um, how, what do you think Neskalinians should be thinking about um, when we're talking about our watershed as a landowner or as a resident or as just somebody who wants to do good by, you know, the environment and by the watershed and by uh, fish and wildlife, but also, you know, for human health as well. Um, what should folks be thinking about and what can an average everyday Neskalinian do to um, sort of uh, push this forward? Ah, that's a good question. Uh, as far as how should I think about water, well, if you're living in Mesquin proper, that's your water source. That's everything you drink, cook with. You flush it down the toilet, it goes to the wastewater plant where it gets treated, and then eventually put back into the stream. So it's, you are part of the cycle, basically. Absolutely. Maybe they ever think about it that way. But. So that's important on both of those things. You want the water to be clean when you drink it. You want the water to be clean when it goes back in the stream. And that happens here, both very advanced treatment systems. As far as, you know, wanting to do good, I think that's most people here. It's a second home. It's valuable property. It's valuable property for these reasons, for the beauty of the area. When I worked for the water district, I would people come into office and tell me how much they love the water. Hmm. They would take it home with them. <laughs> so That's interesting. That always cracked me up. <laughs> uh, Sounds kind of odd, but I mean, it hey, I thought it was <laughs> odd, but you know, but, hey, yeah, you know, that's a nice compliment. But, yeah, absolutely. Um, it's it's a beautiful area, and you know, people like to fish. You like this salmon fish or steelhead or trout, you need clean water, you need proper food in the stream, you need everything to be 
proper for that to continue so that thinking out ahead so your great grandchildren can maybe come and catch a steelhead. Absolutely. Here or in the Mistaka or something. Yeah. So and you might think about water as being a, a kind of a pain in the wind. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, the flooding and everything. Yeah, you have different thoughts about water. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I guess we touched on this a little bit, but sort of that link between watershed health and drinking water, I think is really important around here, especially since we have our water source up on Hawk Creek. Um, so I think it's, you know, it could be another thing that people need to think about. It's really important here, due to the quality of the treatment systems, it can handle, it can handle turbidity. It certainly can't handle you know, organic chemicals and things. That's something you want to keep out of your drinking water or mm -hmm. out of your stream in general. And here it's not a huge, huge problem. But other places, in the valley over there, that, that would be an issue. Absolutely. But here, I don't know. I think people here are pretty used to having good water. Maybe they're blase about it, and that's that's probably a good thing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I suppose so. <laughs> You're not worried about it, right? So until an issue comes up, and people have to start thinking about it. So I love the global warming and the change in weather patterns, and possibly either more rain or less rain or extended periods of either one of those. That changes the whole system. Right. And that's something that the council, I think, you know, will be more and more involved with. Absolutely. Uh, both flooding and drought, it seems to be possible. Yeah, I mean, we live on the coast where we get plenty of rain, but there's still water quantity issues here, and water storage is an issue. Oh, yeah. I've seen summers where we almost went into water curtailment in Nesquilin five years ago, five, six years ago. So could happen. Sure. Interesting. Well, um, I, th I guess we'll end there, but um, really appreciate your time. Um, thank you for being on the board for so long. <laughs> <laughs> thank pleasure, you for hanging right? in there. <laughs> um, yeah, we, we really appreciate your perspective and, uh, and your participation and, uh, you know, yeah. we'll, I can bring one more thing up, even though we're not doing it right now, is our science pups yeah. at the Pelican, which I you know many people come to, but I think more could. We sure. haven't exactly completely packed the room yet. <laughs> Free science discussions, excellent speakers, and you can go buy dinner or buy a beer because the Pelican gives us a room for free. Been a great partner for us. And you come see amazing, amazing speakers. For I'm, I really miss yeah. size bugs right now. Yeah. So. Yeah. You know, get on our mailing list so you know when the, <laughs> when the size pubs are. <laughs> yeah, we'll uh, we'll we'll have to get those up and going as soon as we can. Oh yeah. Those are a lot of fun. Well, thank you very much. So yeah, I don't know if we want to open up for a Q and A. Just if anyone has any questions, we can take it from there. Hi, I, I've got a um, specific, actually, question about where the wetlands um, actually meet um, our one of our um, um, 
public businesses, I guess the golf course, whatever it would be called. How, over time, I, how, how does the council, how do you manage an area like that? It, it appears over time, it, it appears as a resident over time, it's getting the flooding of the areas are getting, and maybe it's due to the drainage or the, um, which will be corrected with that up, the upcoming um, project. But how, how do you manage a area like that, that because over long term, if, if an area can obviously can, continues to be um, flooded, it will reduce the golf course area, which then the public in the community also has a vested interest in. So I'm just, I guess, I know it's a very specific question, but it's on those boundaries, right, of where, you know, the, the, the wetlands and the, the, you know, the habitats where we're protecting, you know, meet, meet the, um, um, interact with the community. Uh, do you want me to take that one? Sure. Um, yeah, so uh, thanks for your question, Gary. Uh, so our watershed council, we're not exactly directly managing these areas. We don't own any land. Um, the area you're referring to, I believe, is on the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service National Wildlife Refuge. Um, in terms of uh, working with the golf course and working with adjacent landowners, um, from uh, working with different landowners um, and conversations we've had with U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, and we've gotten together with different landowners adjacent to those areas who've also experienced flooding issues. Um, a lot of it uh, we attribute to beaver activity. Um, a lot of it we're hoping will be fixed by the egress road project um, and improved drainage um, across that Hawk Street. But um, they're also looking into solutions into um, working with beaver. Um, they're very important for fish habitat, but um, quite frankly, they're a nuisance when it, when it comes to flooding. Um, and so U.S. Fish and Wildlife is going to be looking for solutions on their own property and um, hopefully working with landowners on adjacent properties to come up with a beaver management plan. Um, and we're hoping that can alleviate some of those flood issues. Um, and there's more to come on that um, as we sort of get folks together and start to develop this plan. Thank you. Yeah, that was a great answer, Gosha. Um, yeah, really complete. Um, are there any other questions or uh, I have comments? A I have a question. Um, in regards to this 20 year community planning, what kind of issues do you, you want the community to be thinking about regarding the watershed? Like, are there decisions to be made or um, are there goals that weren't achieved in the last plan that we're trying to get done in the next 20 years? Or like, how does this fit into the community plan? That's a great question. So Rand, you want to take that first and then we'll go back to the watershed council folks. Cause okay. like, that's the, the, thank you so much, Lori. Mm -hmm. That's so like the they, Uber reason why we're all here, but you take it first, Rand. Okay, well, the, the whole, right. The reason we're here is to talk about the issues that then will come up as different land use planning goals. And NESCO needs to determine for each of those goals, what what's relevant for them within that goal. So watershed management, resource management, all those issues will be, will come up against uh, what, what's relevant for Nesquin about that. So the golf course and drainage and the adaptation of Nesquin as sea level rises and the, uh, the marsh has its own you know, it's a tidal marsh, so that's going to fill more and more as the ocean gets larger. We're looking at the adaptation plan that has been developed and is published and is worth reading to educate us about how things are going to change here. It will, uh, will be very important for the public to understand in order to make decisions or engage in surveys with knowledge 
uh, rather than just opinions off the top of their head. So this is talking about our watershed and how that's going to change through the climate crisis and uh, all the research that's been done specifically for Nesca one that is a model for other communities is worthwhile reading the erosion and the adaptation report are both really important documents. So if you can read those, you will see that there are really big implications that have been applied to building standards, to raise buildings, to um, in the future we'll be dealing with riprap and if that needs to go up another six feet in order to keep the ocean from taking over the village. All those things are implied in us having uh, a watershed that we're a part of that we need to understand in order to manage well and then what land use uh, policies or issues will we need to weigh in on and say we want applied to our village or our watershed actually uh, in this process of developing a community plan. Thank that you and I want to add to that be okay. because I, my little piece of this is doing the community survey. Okay, so what's going to happen is after we do these 18 to 20 months of informational town halls, each one on a subject that's in the plan, the in the, the land use document that the county wants us to give input on like that's where we're getting the topics from them and that that if you haven't seen the first the first information town informational town hall on september 22nd that lays out the groundwork for all the rest of them okay so i encourage you to see that one first because then you'll see like what we're doing <laughs> and how we came up with the topics and, and laura your question is so great because i think in your question you said something about was there something that happened 20 years ago that wasn't fulfilled? And what I, I looked at the plan 20 years ago, this wasn't a topic. Like they didn't have the 19 different topics. It wasn't, it wasn't the same way 20 years ago. You know, it was a different process. So it wasn't like something didn't get fulfilled. It was that they just didn't have that. They didn't have the, the, the specific distinction of the 19 topics that we have now. Okay, so I wanted to make sure. So that now, my part of the service. So the other benefit or, or the other outcome of these town halls is to inform the survey that will then inform the plan. So I wanna get that really clear because I'm doing the survey part. Ran and Chris and other people are like doing the plan, but I volunteered the survey. So this is really important to me. And one of the, one of the reasons why we're doing these educational events as informational town halls is because this Q and A portion informs what will be on the future survey, right? So like your question, because you asked this question, Lori, you know, it helps inform what will be on the survey, right? So then it, after the 18 to 20 months, there will be a survey. Then hopefully as many people in that, who are Nesquan citizens as possible will take the survey. That data will be collected, analyzed, and then given to the people who are going to be writing the plan. Is that, I, so I just wanted you to know all that because that's how this all fits in. Now that's way, that was taking like the meta back, like 10, that was the 10,000 foot view of why we're doing all this. Now I'd like to give it back to, to Garsha or Caleb to see if there's anything more specific, like now in the context of what Rand and I just said, <laughs> um, what should the Nesco and citizens know about this? Okay, back to you guys to bring it on home to um, today. Brenda, th this is Guy and, and yeah. Maybe I can just interject yes, something here. Someone from the Watershed Council, <laughs> not me. Now you guys. All right. Um, so I, I just want to say a couple of things about the community plan. Um, you know, it's a big part of the community plan is to help the county make decisions uh, when issues come before the county about Nescoin. I mean, and that's certainly a big part, and that's a lot of the land use kinds of things, but other kinds of decisions as well. I mean, we have issues surrounding uh, short-term rentals and those kinds of things that the community plan may explore a little bit and and uh, and come up with some uh, some guidance for the community and for the county. I think you heard what from Gershaw and Caleb is that there's some land issues in the watershed, whether it's the the federal refuge, U.S. Fish and Wildlife, Division of State Lands. There's flooding issues, there's ODOT issues. And 
our CAC helps represent our community to those agencies. And so as we think about as a community, I mean, I maybe one example is, you know, with climate change, with uh, things that may be impacting the refuge, how, how is the refuge uh, and, it's, and it's kind of uh, how it interacts with our community, you know, whether it's through flooding issues all the way down Hawk, um, it, it's uh, other uh, management issues in, within the refuge, uh, which is part of our watershed, the essential part of our watershed. And so I think that in community plan, we should be thinking about and addressing things over for the next 20 years and increasing our involvement, I think, in some of the management of those lands. Any other thoughts, Kayla, regarding <laughs> thoughts on this or anyone else from the council? specific things about what was the context and then watershed stuff? Well, well, I would just chime back in to say that uh, the, the management of our drinking water watershed is, a, is an issue that we hopefully in the next 20 years will have as our own, that we will own our own watershed so we can take responsibility for the quality of the water that comes into it and get it out of uh, uh, a variety of different owners that right now are cooperating, but I think that that's, that's a really important issue and others can speak to that. Uh, we're trying to have the watershed actually be the definition of our community so that when we're thinking about 20 years from now, we're actually considered considering the entire watershed and, and its health and its value as a part, as we are a part of it and it is a part of our community. So we're trying to enlarge the thinking by people who, who attend these meetings and, and start to think about their community as more than just each other and, and our pets and things, but actually the place where we live and all the things that contribute to our quality of life here, which seems to be a real important reason why people are in Neskowin. So as we make the community plan, forest resource issues, uh, maybe the ch need to move housing upland and get out. Some people will be having to get out of the village when it starts to flood and it's uninhabitable in parts. I mean, that's 20 years from now, if we don't do something pretty serious, <laughs> it's gonna change. So. I think the watershed is one of the more in, important issues that we have to consider when we're thinking about our community and thinking about 20 years from now. Yeah, well said, Brian. Agreed, I was just, just gonna point out today's flooding on Hawk Drive, good good examples. Yeah. So, pretty, pretty commonplace. Yeah. Um, I, I've got a, actually a few comments. <clears throat> You just brought up relocating, and I was sitting back here thinking, well, that's just such an off-the-wall comment. I won't even say anything about <laughs> that. But other, I, it's, it's actually good to hear out of the box, right? I mean, just really looking that far ahead and going, what is reality uh, for our area? And just the other comment I'm going to make, and I know I've worked with Guy and Alex. Um, I sit on the water board, and um, we've had been having long, there have been discussions for quite a while about the um, ownership and the quality of the, the, of the watershed. And it's actually good to hear in a community forum, um, the interest um, of the community in that, in, in managing and having control and in and, and the quality of that, that watershed. Absolutely yep. important. My my only comment would be that you guys are thinking really, really uh, ahead in terms of other watersheds I've been around. And as long as there's people who are engaged as you guys, I will happily keep planning events and happily keep making videos for you guys to watch because <laughs> I can tell you guys are really soaking it up and that it makes my job a lot, a lot, uh, a lot more fun to do. 
nice nice work would be my comment good good to hear that Nesquin is a magical place. And I think this is part of the magic is the engagement of, of us. You know, I mean, I think this town hall, uh, I organized it. So I think it's going really well. <laughs> and I'm glad that this is actually turning into a conversation. And I, I'm only saying that now because we want to have a lot of conversations, all you Nesquin citizens about these things. This is a continuing conversation. Um, so it's great to see the passion and the interest. So any other comments about uh, any other questions out there? We're still open. Okay. Well, thanks very much, everyone. And, and I have one more. Oh, go ahead, Lori. So my other one is you mentioned like that people, the, is the watershed involved in managing the Nusquin March or is the, is the government organization that manages that, are they even open to the Nesquin having input? Like, does it go both ways or do they just tell Nesquin what's gonna happen? I don't have that answer. <laughs> uh, well, there's, a, there's a wide open line of communication, Lori, with the, the person in charge out of Newport of all the wildlife refuges. Uh, would you agree, Dr. Sievert? Yeah. Well, also, uh, when the, the uh, Coastal Refuge uh, people did a, uh, updated their uh, long range plan for the Nescoan Refuge, the Stucco Refuge, they uh, opened it up to the CAC for input. Mm -hmm. That was about, what, six, seven years ago or something like that. So I think every 10 years they redo that plan. And uh, People in Nesquin did have an opportunity at that time to give input. And I know there was a lot of issues about the tsunami trail going through the refuge and how that could be managed or improved. And, and uh, some of it did result in the previous refuge manager of opening up to the possibilities of at least putting si official signs up and things like that to indicate that we had a tsunami evacuation trail. Um, but yeah, so the, the refuge people in particular are open to Nesquin <clears throat> input on planning. And as, as Guy said earlier, the CAC is the means by which the village and the community can speak to those agencies. That's, that's what it's created to do. Right. That's its role. Okay. Basically Thanks. to facilitate the, that dialogue. Right. If they implement um, projects and they have uh, sort of actions that they do on their refuge as well, um, sometimes they'll open it up for public comment. If you want to comment as an individual, um, you would just need to be sort of keyed into their their line of communication. But um, but they but they do but they are open for public comment sometimes, depending on the project. Well, I was just thinking if we're making a community plan and we're talking about watershed issues and that's such a big piece of property within our watershed that having some official way that our thoughts get from our plan get presented to them seems like a powerful opportunity. Yeah, I agree. I think they should be involved in the conversation somehow. Ryan, you're muted, right? Looks like you're trying to talk on mute. That's probably a good thing. Um, <laughs> as these different subject matters of forest, forestry management or resource management, there'll be other opportunities in the 18 or 19 uh, different subject matters that maybe we will be talking directly to fish and wildlife and some of those people about the marsh as a resource and as you know, their perspective and then maybe what the, uh, from the survey, we would have uh, specific things that people who are, I mean, the village, it seems to be very connected to not only the golf course, but the marsh and that whole environment. As we go along and the planning goes along, I think that more and more people will have specific questions about that for those agencies and will want to bring those people into the conversation. So they realize that our community really cares and, and 
wants to understand better how to interact with it. Great. And just following up on what Rand just said, it just made me think like, well, the unique power that Nesquin citizens have, like this doesn't happen very often in other places, first of all. Like, because we're un unincorporated and we're in Tillamook County, we get to do this. You know, if we were incorporated, it'd be a city and all this would be more up to the city council, it'd be so different. So <laughs> just saying, that's a conversation for another day, but I'm saying we have a rare opportunity to actually be more involved in the, in the future destiny of our community. And so I just feel like let's not squander it. So I'm helping to create the crucible of the conversation. So Keep yeah, one question okay. about process, um, just again about the water district and the comp tying in the conversation um, for the 20 year plan. Is part of the process here, does someone actually go and talk to the, the I know we have a community meeting, but what about like the businesses, like the water district, like the, I mean, does someone physically go and, and talk to those to, to get both their input and then to ensure that they're on their long-term plans once things are, there has to be some type of agreement, I would have. Who wants to take that? I, and I'm not sure, wait, what is the question? Are you saying in terms of the community plan, are we eliciting those who are making the survey and getting the input? Are we asking for those people to participate? Is, was that your question? Because I'm yeah, not sure. Yeah, they're, they're tied into it so that as, yeah. as something like the, the individual water district they will be part of the discussion somewhere, I assume. And so that whatever input they have and whatever input comes out of the survey or wherever the community wants to go, that that's agreed to so that it makes it into their plan, 20 year plan. Gary, okay. Gary oh. if I can, um, I'm happy to address it. We approach both the service districts, the water and the sewer for their projections of growth. And those go into directly into the community plan. Yeah, but what about the topic of, of the um, watershed? Well, well, as far as the survey, if I could just say, because I'm working on a survey. So Alex and Rand and other people here will say their parts because there are people that are writing the community plan. That's not me. I'm in charge of one of the persons that are helping the surveys. In terms of the survey, we are going to try to we are going to try to do massive outreach. And personally, I would like to, to blow out the charts of the people at the amount of numbers of people <laughs> who will fill out the survey. Um, so we're gonna outreach to everyone to fill out the survey. Um, but then Alex and Rand and others can talk about how that, like the, it sounds like Alex, you just described, there's additional input from the community plan writers um, to well, elicit. Uh, we're, using, we're using forecasts of those districts and you know, we're embedding them, for lack of a better term. They're in the they're in the uh, the plan. So, uh, as far as that aspect of your question, Gary, we're we're in sync. We're not we're taking what the districts give us as as far as forecasted growth and the county community development department too. I would add. So, uh, anyway, there's sources to to have us fill in those gaps. Well, and it would be great if the if the two service districts. Uh, would think about the community plan and what the implications are from their point of view and provide a perspective or even come, you know, have one of these town halls where the sewer or the water board says, these are the four issues we think are relevant for us in thinking it for the next 20 years and what the implications are for our, our services. Maybe so, a joint joint meeting by them to do just that. Yeah, yeah, I, I hope that happens. Yeah. And we, if we are can prompt that, we will prompt that <laughs> so that so that you guys think about it and give us that input because that will be really important for people in the community to understand what the two services, uh, what the implications are in thinking ahead 20 years. Well, someone, all that needs is someone to put that on an agenda. Should we make it like an informational town hall about that discussion? I don't know. Someone that goes on someone's agenda. Maybe it's you know, what, you know what, Brenda, it ties into your infrastructure. Should we incorporate? Right. All right. Meeting on that, on that topic. Right. Yeah, so no, we it weaves right in there. 
Okay, great. So thank you. See, this is benefit. We're, we're, this is all recorded. So when we have that discussion, we can we can have a panel. And so all these folks are on a panel and there you go. present around that issue and other issues. Yeah, we're definitely inviting every, you know, the major stakeholders to panels at some point because there's those 19 topics and it's my role. The reason why I'm so excited about hearing what you guys are saying is I need to hear what all this so I can help put these panels together. That's what I'm right. Well, that's what I do. Like Ran and Chris and I'll get information from Guy, like all the guys. Well, you, and you have <laughs> Gary. Gary, you are the president, right, of the board, or am I incorrect? Yeah, whoever talks. I talk to a lot. Yeah, I am not the president. But you have a board member of the Water District to start right now. Oh, oh yeah. Right. We're, we're, yeah, yeah. And uh, I, I, I'm well aware. <laughs> but we, 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 yeah, if you weren't informed, I mean, this is the process, but we'll invite the, the district to a, a, a panel or two, and then you can decide which representatives you want to speak. Does that well, sound? And also, I, we, we, have, we actually have a board meeting on what day is today, on, on Thursday. So I will be bringing this information back of what okay. is going on because it's important that they also get their 20 year plan in sync and, 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 and updated for. For this cycle um, yeah that's so important yes thank you this is this is the benefit of this kind of thing right. and participation so yeah. thank you gary for showing up today <laughs> all right back to uh, more questions comments okay. any other additional questions from anyone in the uh, in attendee list well we really appreciate everyone uh participating tonight and checking this out and um i hope you'll continue to attend brenda thank you so much for setting this all up and uh yes, chris you. and you and, and caleb and gershon uh, put a really great thing together tonight so thank you very much bravo yeah thank you bravo. thanks hey thanks, guys you're welcome it's, oh, it's, our, it's my pleasure it's our pleasure great any Last things, Brenda. I was just saying this will be posted. We're going to edit all this. You know, we'll make it look nice. So there'll be the video and the Q and A posted to the Nesquin Community Channel. And I did put the link up there. And Caleb is going to post it somewhere where you can find it. Also, the the link to the Nesquin Community Channel. So all that'll happen. And all I just to say, I beg of you, tune in to the future informational town halls because each one is equally exciting, if not. <laughs> and I promise. Was this, or maybe I'm not, was was this not better than Netflix? Isn't this more interesting? <laughs> uh, tell me I'm wrong. Like, am I wrong? Because this is about us. Right. I mean, this is really, this is like, if you know, anyway. Thank you all for coming. That was my comment. Tune in next time. Uh, and Caleb, your, your Watershed Council, Caleb Garshaw, the guys, any, everyone on the board, great job. Thank you. I was I was moved and motivated. So you succeeded. <laughs> Thanks everyone. Have a great uh -huh. evening. So you can exit. I'll, I'll let it be open before I close the room, so you can exit when you want to. And okay. I'll stop the recording. I'm going to stop the recording. Yes.